so glad you are here today. You guys doing all right? Yeah, well, welcome, and uh, welcome to the Durham campus. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to welcome all the campuses, but particularly today, the Hillsboro crowd, they've been hanging out here at Durham for a while. The Hillsboro crowd went back to Hillsboro, and so we love you guys over there. We're excited uh, about your campus and just excited that you have landed back on location. So on three, let's welcome all the campuses. One, two, three. How many of you were here last week? Just by show of hands, not to make anybody feel guilty, just show of hands. And if you weren't here, how many of you watched the message online? Okay, great. For those of you who were neither, let me just encourage you, go back and watch the message from last week. Uh, Pastor Mike Bro delivered an unbelievable message, uh, the first installment of this series. He talked about unshakable hope. And um, he said in the beginning of the message, you might recall, he said, there are some words uh, that, that expire. Some words kind of like, like sour milk, they go bad in time. You know what I'm saying? And uh, he said, the word that, that doesn't ever go bad is the word hope. And I was thinking, that's really true. I mean, I love the word hope. Thus, we named our church, what? New Hope. Um, and, and there are other words that that don't expire that you kind of want them to expire. Do you have any that come to mind? Like I got a few that, you know, you wish those words would be put away. But as, as Mike was talking last week, I realized there's another word that has a long shelf life as well. It never goes bad. It never expires. I'm talking about the word grace. Everybody say grace. grace. I'm talking about the word grace. Amazing what? grace, how what? Sweet the sound that saved a wretch like, don't point at your neighbor, <laughs> saved a wretch like who? Me. I'm excited to talk to you today about installment two, unshakable grace. And you must know that there is no other subject that I enjoy speaking about as much as the subject of grace. And maybe it's because I need it every day. Can I get a witness? I, I'm not a witness to my fall in this, but, but to the fact that, you, <laughs> that you, you might need it every day as well. Let's talk about grace today. Open up your Bibles. First Peter, let's jump right in. No time to play. First Peter chapter one. Uh, we're gonna start in verse 13. If you love the word of the Lord, let me hear an amen. amen. I'm excited about talking to you today about grace. Here it is. Therefore, now you've heard me say over and over and over, if there is a therefore in the scripture, you should ask, what is it there for? And last week, uh, Pastor Bro talked about hope in the first 12 verses. So he's talking about hope. We're picking up today to talk about grace. Watch this. With minds that are alert. Are you guys alert? Are you really? I mean, it's, it's 1030 worship celebration. You should definitely be alert. With, with, with minds that are alert and fully, are you guys sober? <laughs> Don't answer if you're not. It's a little early, man. Um, no, seriously, if you're not, like let us know if you need help. <laughs> I'm serious. Um, with minds that are alert, and, and when you really study this word sober in the Greek, it's not inebriation like we tend to think. It, it's another way of, of Peter saying with alertness, like be dialed in, get, no cloud, no fogginess, get dialed in. Fully alert and fully sober. Set your, what's that word? On the, set the what? Hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Hopefully you haven't given up on old school Bible. If you got an old school Bible in your lap, circle the word hope, draw an arrow to the word grace. Because the cool thing about the way this series is cracking open is that bro talked about hope last week, unshakable hope, and I get to talk to you about unshakable grace today. And here's the reality, our hope a very popular trendy word right now, right? Our hope, biblically speaking, in the faith speaking, has to be directly connected to the grace of Jesus Christ. If you place your hope in anything else, it will not end well for you, for us, right? I put together a little diagram here. When I say I put together, I mean the computer graphics people put it together when I described it. <laughs> Just so we're clear. Um, hope. Like, who doesn't like to have hope? Come on, who in 2020 at times 
could use a little more hope, right? Hope on earth is directly connected to, inextricably linked to the grace of Jesus Christ found on the cross. And if you put your hope anywhere else, it will not end well for you. And that is what a lot of people do. Listen, if you, we, put our hope in religion and not ultimately in the grace of God, it will not end well for you. Religion, sounds good, right? No, 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 no. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. Christianity is God reaching us in and through Jesus Christ. If you put your ultimate hope in, I don't know, sports, right? We all love sports. Well, most of us do. And not in the grace of God, it will not end well for you. You will end up disappointed. If you put your hope, come on, this is relevant, is it not? If you put your hope in politics and not ultimately Jesus Christ, you will be sorely disappointed. It will not end well for you. If you put your hope in a vaccine, right? And not the grace of God, it will not end well for you. If you're a physically fit kind of person and you put your ultimate hope in your exercise regimen and not the grace of God, it will not end well for you. One more, if you put your hope in a pastor like me, it will not end well for you. There is only, come on church, there is only one place where you can put your ultimate hope and it not let you down. Is that, is it, and that is in a blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ where he spread wide his arms and said, I love you eternally. That is where hope is found. So Peter takes us there right away. And if that is true, if it is true, then it is so imperative that today you Every single person at every single campus walks away, and those of you who are online, walk away with a crystal clear HD understanding of the amazing grace of God. And that is what I wanna to talk to you about today. And if you don't know Christ, let me just go and warn you. It's gonna be the best news you've ever heard. If you do know Christ, you came here today as a Christian, it should fire you up because I'm telling you, this is a story, this is a message that never, ever expires. It never gets old. Now, Peter, I think it's really important that we understand a context of 1 Peter. If you, again, if you go old school in your Bible, write this in the margins or take notes on your phone. Peter, it's very important to remember the context. Peter was written around 60 AD after the death of Christ. Peter was written in a time when the world was in a bad, bad place. It makes it very relevant to our time. Emperor Nero was mad and bad. And I mean bad in the wrong way. Christians were being killed. They were scattered throughout. It's not like Peter, sometimes we kind of you know, misunderstand or we don't, we don't realize the context. It's not like Peter was sitting in a Starbucks somewhere going, hey, can I get another latte? Let me write to the, to the Christians out there. Ooh, can I show you my new iPad? Ooh, I got a nice iPad stand. Let me no, no, Peter was in persecution. These were hard, hard times. And Peter says, I need to talk to you about the most important thing, and that is grace. And if you're gonna have any hope in these days, you have to connect it to grace. Verse 21, we're gonna keep going back to the text today. So if you haven't opened it yet, open up your Bibles to 1 Peter or your phones or whatever. Let's read this one out loud. Ready, church? Go. To this you were, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So Peter says, hey, we're going to suffer. And come on, how many of you are ready for a new year? 2020 has been, been something. Can I just go ahead and offer you a prophetic warning though? Just because we cross into a new year does not mean that just magically everything is going to become okay. Now I'm gonna celebrate on New Year's Eve that 2020 is done, but it might continue to be tough times. And as Christians, I find this to be a serious mistake that we tend to make. We tend to think that if I'm just a good person, 
If I go to church, or if I pay my taxes, or if I let that rude driver cut me off and I just let them on in, right? We tend to think that we're not going to endure hard times. The scripture never says that. Look at verse 22. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who what? Judges justly. Circle that. We're going to talk about judge at the end. Judges justly. Let's continue. Now, this is, this is really, really important. So lean in. Remember, alert, sober-minded. He himself, that is Jesus, bore our what? Sins in his body on the cross. Everybody say, in his body. Everybody say, on the cross. In his body, on the cross. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now he's quoting the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 53, five. Again, write that in the margins. And he's letting us know that every single person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We might as well look at Isaiah as well. Look at what the prophet said here in Isaiah 53, six. Ready? Go. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Iniquity is not a popular word. We don't use it much anymore. It's simply utter immorality, sinfulness, gross unfairness in the world, if you will. The Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So the first thing we've got to understand if we're gonna understand grace is we have to understand our fallen nature. I mean, let me look at it this way with you. Who is the most godly person you've ever known? Maybe you say mom or a dad or a grandparent. Who is the most godly, righteous, Christ-like person you've ever known? I see some pleasant looks coming across your faces as you think of those beautiful people. Now, maybe think about somebody that you don't know. Who would you say is the most godly, Christ-like person? Maybe you didn't know him personally, but that you've witnessed or seen in our lifetimes. Who, who would you say? Come on, give me some feedback here today. Who would you say? Billy Graham, I would have said that as well. Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa I would have said that as well. Nelson Mandela, maybe? Yeah, Mariana Rivera, Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, you, you could, it, it could go on and on and on. Um, and, and so think about this though. Of all those people that you know are Christ-like and righteous, how do they compare to the holiness of God? Put your totem pole up here, if you will. God's at the very top of the totem pole. He is at the, 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 the pinnacle of righteousness and holiness. And I don't know, where, where would you be? Maybe that's a good question to camp out on. Where would you be? I'd be, I'd be down here. Let me just, I'd, I'd be down here. Like, I, I need grace every day in my life. Can I get a witness? Is anybody with me? I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I would be down here. But wherever those other people are, the, the, the highest person of righteousness and Christ-likeness of a human person that we might know or we've heard of, there's still, this is the point, there's still a divide, a chasm, if you will, between them and the righteousness of God. Are you tracking with me? There's a deafening divide that has to be made up because God is holy and because God is holy, sinfulness cannot be in the presence of God. Are you, are you tracking with me? Here's the first thing to write down. This is really, really important. Sin separates us from God. And maybe you've never heard it put that way. But because of God's righteousness, and it's hard for us to really comprehend the holiness of God. 
I mean, we sometimes think when we get to heaven, I'm gonna be high-fiving people. When we get to heaven, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play football on the streets of gold. And when we get, no, no, no. When we get to heaven, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna fall on our face because we're gonna be in the presence of pure divinity, pure holiness. And because God is holy, now we have, a, we have an easier time understanding sinfulness, right? Because we're all sinful. But because of the sinfulness of humanity and the holiness of God, sin separates us from God. Now that's the bad news. Are you ready for some good news? Can I get an amen? The gospel response to the fallenness of humanity goes to the next verse. Look at it. Verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Sin separates us from God. God reconciles us back to him. That's the second nugget. Write it in. Grace reconciles us to God. Sin does what? Grace does what? Sin does what? Separates. Grace does what? Reconciles. Illustration. Imagine that you, um, you were in debt. Let's, how much you want to say you were in debt by? Let's, let's say you were in debt by a half a million dollars. Not a pleasant thought. But you were in debt by $500,000. And um, you lost your job. You couldn't pay your debt. You are in dire straits, right? Let's just make it even more personal uh, for the church. And let's just say, maybe I'll speak this prophetically for somebody, right? Let's just say you were in a life group. And in life group, you do life together. And uh, since so many life groups are virtual right now, we'll call it a virtual life group. And you share via Zoom with your life group that you are in bad trouble, you owe $500,000 and there's no way you can pay it. At the end of the life group, the member of your life group reaches out directly to you and says, hey, uh, can you meet me for breakfast in the morning? I feel like the spirit of God has spoken to me and I would like to pay off your debt. Do you think you would make breakfast? You show up, you're a little skeptical, you're not sure it's for real, but you show up, you have a nice breakfast together, and at the end, he slips a 500G check right across the table to you. How are you gonna respond? Huh? Hallelujah, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? Now, now here, here's, the, here's the key question to the story. Can you boast about it? Can you take any credit for now being out of debt? Come on, come on. No, absolutely none. Why? You had nothing to do with it. The generous benefactor bailed your butt out, right? And allowed you to get out of debt. That's the message of Christianity. In my sinfulness, in my brokenness, I had a debt that I could not pay. I was eternally in debt. But God in Christ reconciled me back to him. He bore, come on, my sin debt on the cross. And I am now swimming in the grace of God, free forever, <laughs> eternally bound. Yes, praise you, God. Yes, it's the greatest news Christianity has ever delivered. It's the greatest faith the world has ever known. Most faiths, you know this if you studied them, most world religions are faith. They're merit-based. They're based upon how good you are. They're based upon whether or not you can earn your way to God. That's religion. Religion is my attempt to reach God. Christianity is letting God reach me by the fact that Jesus Christ bore my sins on a cross. Can you say amen? Hey, let's kind of start to wrap up. Verse 17. I told you we were gonna circle back to this idea of God as judge. Verse 17. 
Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, check it out. Live out your time as, and, and Peter says this throughout the book, you're gonna pick up on this theme, as foreigners. In other places, he will, he will call us strangers. Do you ever feel like you're a stranger on planet Earth? As this, as this world, and particularly as America, goes further and further spiraling southward, if you will, and you become more and more committed to trying to live out this book, do you ever feel like a, a foreigner? Like this is not your home. He would refer to us as aliens at times, strangers in the land. Who judges each person's work impartially. Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Let's continue. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Now let's read this next part together, ready? Everybody in, alert and sober, go. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Let's continue, all together. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are what? In God. Now, when we think of God as a judge, again, we tend, fear can creep in and we can tend to start leaning towards works righteousness and I can never really be good enough. But did you catch it? The Bible says that he is a righteous judge, that he judges impartially. Now, here's what that means. That means that if you are in Christ, when you die one day, and the Bible says this, by the way, we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, every single person. It doesn't matter who you are. If you've ever lived on planet earth or you ever will, the Bible says every single person will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And sometimes that makes us fearful, but this is what you gotta understand about grace. If you are in Christ, when you stand before God and your life flashes before God, and you might think of all the negative things you've done, God's gonna look at you, but because Jesus bore your sins on the cross, he's not going to see or pay attention to your sin. Jesus is gonna be right there at the right hand of the Father and he will say to the Father, he's mine, she's mine. That person is a Christian. They've accepted the free gift of grace and I belong to you, God. That's good news. True story, and, and, and we'll wrap up. Um, a young lady uh, committed a crime, and she, of course, was in the courtroom, and she was standing before a judge, and word was this was a kind judge, a righteous judge, and she, because of her crime, she had a steep fine that she had to pay, but here was the problem. She couldn't afford it, and so she stood before the judge, and the judge had a kind demeanor to him, but again, the judge was righteous and there had to be justice. And so the judge heard her case, spoke a few kind words to her, but he did what a righteous judge needs to do. He declared the verdict. Here's the fine that you have to pay. She didn't have the money, but he declared it anyway. Here's your fine. And he slammed the gavel down but in that moment, the judge then stood up from the bench. I love this. Took off his robe, walked around the bench, went to the young lady, took out his wallet, and gave her the money to pay the fine. I came by to let you know today that that is a picture of the gospel. You see, the woman who stood before the judge that day, you might say, why would a judge do that? It came to be found out later by those in the courtroom that day that the woman was the judge's daughter. He declared the fine, but he came around the bench to pay the fine 
for his daughter. I wanna let you know that 2,000 years ago, the ultimate judge, the righteous judge of all eternity looked down upon you, his beloved son or daughter, and you were guilty, dead in your sins, and the verdict was clear, guilty. But in the fullness of time, the Bible says that that God sent forth Jesus Christ. He, he came around the bench, if you will. He took off his righteous kingly robe and he came around and he paid your sin debt. He paid something that you could never pay. He bought you on a cross. And if you will receive that gift, you can walk out here today a saved, redeemed child of the most high God. That's the gospel. You might say, well, how, how do I tap into that? What, what, what do I have to do? <laughs> Great question. You don't have to do anything. It's been done for you. You just simply say, God, I receive. And I wanna give you a chance to do that today. If you're a Christian, I hope you'll walk out of here today with a renewed skip in your step. Again, this message never gets old. Can I get an amen from the believers? It's good. That's, hey, if you're not a believer, or you're online somewhere and you're, like, you're not sure you're a Christian, that's why we clap. We clap because it's the greatest news the world has ever known. If you're a Christian, I hope you'll walk out of here today just, just renewed and confident, sealed in your faith that you realize that your hope is in the grace of Jesus. But if you're not, I wanna give you a chance to do that today because it is unshakable grace. If 2020 has taught us anything, it has taught us that we are not in control. It has taught us that all of our false uh, illusions of control don't, don't measure up. And it's taught us, has it not, that this world is very shakable. The grace of God is not shakable. And once it gets a hold of you, check it out, you'll never be able to shake it off. You'll live the rest of your life enamored with the grace of Jesus. He loves you that much. And you might think it's a coincidence that you're here today or you're You've logged on online or you're at a campus. It's not a coincidence. I believe God is speaking to your heart today. Will you pray with me? God, we, um, we're so grateful and we are humbled by your grace. And we just want to pause today to Thank you for reminding us of the gospel. Thank you for this power-packed book in the back of the New Testament. Thank you that it is so relevant to where we are today. And Father, I pray that you would meet every single person wherever they are. God, if you, if you would just minister to the believers here today, if you came to a campus or you're online and you're in Christ and you know him, Hopefully this message encourages you and solidifies you even more in the grace, but probably what it will also do is it will remind you that if there are sins in your life, if there's areas in which you're struggling right now, maybe it's a sin that just has continued to haunt you, or maybe it's, maybe it's something new. I wanna give you a moment just to do business with God. I wanna give you a moment to say, Father God, I need your grace. I am a sinner, I am broken, and you know this area, and I just need to plead the blood of Jesus. As Peter will say in the weeks ahead, I need to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. What is it that's, in your life right now that you need God to forgive you of. 
Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's a hard heart. Maybe it's a, a behavior. Maybe it's something you've done to someone. Whatever it is, can you just confess that to God today? It's between you and God. I'm gonna get out of the way in a moment and just let you pray, God, I need your grace. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, if, remember sin separates us from God, if we confess our sins, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. 1 John 1, 9. So what is it, beloved? Confess it to God. Let's just park here for a moment and give you a moment to just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I think in the contemporary church, we've, we've neglected the fact that sin still grieves the heart of God, so it should grieve me. Confess it, turn from it, and walk out of here today in the grace of God. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. We confess. We repent. And we plead the blood of your son. Hey, if you're not a believer today, we're so glad you've been with us. It's quite simple, actually. I apologize for all the pastors and the ways in which we sometimes make it complicated. If you desire to know Christ today and you want to get up from wherever you are today and know that you know that you are saved and redeemed and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you are going to spend eternity with God, You've got to do business with your sinfulness, your fallen nature. You say, well, well, I didn't do anything to get this. I know we were all born into it. <laughs> and we're all invited into the grace that he offers. Hey, if you desire to know Jesus on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to do something bold. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. It's just between you and God, all heads are bowed, eyes are closed. But the Bible says that you can know, you can be born again. One, God loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, on a life-saving, sin-forgiving mission to redeem your life forever. Two, Jesus agreed to come crawled up on a cross where he shed his blood. He paid the price for you to be born again and know God and to have a hope that will never fade. Three, Jesus Christ raised from the dead that you too might defeat death when you die one day. Three, just raise your hand. Just lift it up wherever you are. I see, oh yeah, praise God. Hold it up high. I see you three in the back. You folks right here, praise God. I see you folks, raise it up. I'll just lift it up high one more time. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Help me follow you all the days of my life till I meet you face to face. And I pray it in the name of the righteous judge, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all of God's children declared together. Come on, church. Amen and amen. Yeah, I was getting ready to set it up, but you went there anyway. 
Hey, if you're online or at a campus, we're just celebrating you. Welcome home. Welcome to the family of God. You can stop trying to earn it. You can start, stop trying to grit it out. Listen, all you got to do is keep receiving it and walking in the grace of God. And when you fall short, you declare the grace of God and you confess your sins. And God will start to transform your life. Amazing grace. What? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like who? Me. I'm gonna invite all the worship pastors to come on out at all the campuses and that's actually the song that we're gonna sing today. And we're gonna strip it down like no band. We're gonna strip it down. I want you to sing about the grace of God. And when it gets to that part where where it talks about your wretchedness, your brokenness, own it. Like own it, say, God, I am a sinner. But then you lift your head and with a smile on your face, you sing about the amazing grace of God because he gets the glory and the praise for your life and mine, amen? Stand to your feet, come on, and let's sing together. God. 